And joining us now, Bill Blair, Chief of the Toronto Police Service, and we're glad to have you back in the studio and in that chair. We were supposed to do this a couple of weeks ago, but you were under the weather, so we're glad you're feeling better now. I'm glad to be here. There are a ton of things that we could talk about in the next half an hour, but I'm going to focus on three, just so you can get your head around what we want to talk about. The black bloc techniques, the peaceful protests, the five-meter rule. That's it. Let's start with this. What did you see as your responsibility that weekend? I have a balanced responsibility, and, and, and first and foremost, I'm responsible for the safety of the, the city of Toronto uh, to ensure that people, innocent people are not victimized, uh, to prevent crime and to prevent disruptions of the, the peace of this city. But it is balanced with the responsibility to ensure that people who have come here to engage in lawful, peaceful protests are allowed to do so. And, and, and to strike that balance is, is one of the great challenges of, of, of policing uh, events of this kind. But you know, we, we have a lot of experience in this city uh, with managing protests. And, How well and, do you think you did that weekend? Well, I have to, I have to say, I, th I think over the course of the entire week, uh, we had a number of very large demonstrations. On Saturday, we were particularly challenged. We had nearly 10,000 people who were engaged in, in what was uh, clearly a, a, a lawful protest. And we were doing everything we could to facilitate that. We began with, it was mostly the labor movement, and we began with them at Queen's Park. We marched with them. We they, they spread it over a fair distance, but, but they were well organized and, and working very collaboratively with us to keep that peaceful and you know, give them the opportunity to say their piece, which is every Canadian's right but at the same way to do it and in, 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 to do that protest in, in such a way which maintained the peace okay, and which was start. lawful. But unfortunately, there was a very large group, several hundred people, who were intent not on protest but on violence and vandalism. That's where I'm going to start here. Let's, I know you've seen these images a thousand times. Um, this was four months ago, so we're going to remind everybody. Michael, if you would, here's the footage from the G20 summit. This was on Saturday, and we all remember the black bloc techniques. Those are pretty unusual pictures for our streets, I think you would agree. A uh, billion dollars was spent on security, and I guess the first question that we got from numerous viewers was, where were the police then? You know, I have to say, a very legitimate question. I'll tell you where the police were. We had almost 2,000 police officers out on the street uh, at that time. The overwhelming majority of them were in two locations. One, the, our, most of our mobile resources, our officers on bikes, were doing what they normally do, and they were working with the protest that was taking place. The protest didn't suddenly vanish and end. We, we continued to police that protest. We had nearly 10,000 people spread out across Queen Street and up Spadina returning to the area of Queen's Park. The majority of the other police resources available to us were in, in public safety uh, mode. They were wearing riot gear. They were protecting the summit site. That's why we had those additional so police officers there. Center, well, not at the, at the convention center, but deployed north of the convention center in, in an effort to, to prevent uh, the, the protesters and those in, intent on, on criminality so from reaching the, reaching the perimeter, of, the perimeter of, okay. of, of, of the summit site. Unfortunately, when the, the, the people who came to, to commit crimes uh, were unable to penetrate that security wall, then they turned their attention elsewhere. They ran away from that security. They ran to the northeast up Young Street. They attacked the city. When they couldn't attack the summit, they attacked the city. And, and it, it is very unfortunate, and, and, and we, a matter that we've been reviewing within our service on tactics that we can undertake to ensure that we're able to de deploy and remove our resources more readily. We couldn't disengage from the 10,000 people we were, we were managing in the large protest. The officers that were deployed across the, for the security of the summit site, most of those resources had to remain there, but the ability to move them rapidly, to get them, because they're wearing a lot of gear, to get them onto buses, to, to deploy them away from a crowd that's running up the street and engaging in criminal, criminal acts, it, it did take a long time to get up there. Okay, but I wonder if that was part of your thinking. If I, if I move my officers away from the perimeter of the summit site to deal with this violence, I'm going to leave them vulnerable. We had, that we part had, of the we had then three responsibilities, Steve. But what had happened is, is we had a, a large protest that we were policing. We had the responsibility for maintaining the security of the summit site. And then we had a, a group of people that came to commit crimes in our city, to smash windows and to burn cars, and, and to loot to some of those stores. And why wasn't and there a faster time. response to that group? Well, frankly, because of the way we had our, our police officers deployed, mostly de dealing with the protest and, and the summit site, we did not have intelligence that they were going to attack 
uh, more vulnerable areas of the city. We, we, our information was that they were coming to, to the summit site in an effort to protest. When they weren't able to do that, they turned their criminal intent elsewhere. And it did take some time to, to get out there and to contain it. But once, once we were able to re remove those resources, we were able to effectively over the course of the rest of the week. And I think it's also important to note the criminal intent, the criminal conspiracy to, to, to engage in those acts of vandalism and violence didn't end on Saturday afternoon. It continued throughout the weekend. And we were gathering a lot of information and monitoring the activities of that crowd. And, and we were doing everything we could throughout the course of the entire weekend to prevent a repeat okay, let me of what read we had a, seen on Saturday afternoon. I want to read a quote here from Joe Warmington, who thinks of himself as a friend of the cops and has written some good stuff about the police over the years. He's a Toronto Sun columnist. He says, a police source tells me the only thing that stopped the officers from stopping the black bloc tactics was an order telling them not to. They tell me they could have rounded up all or most of them in no time. But even before that decision was made, says one insider, there was mass confusion and indecision. Quote, the orders went from engage to no, don't engage, to engage to no, don't engage, said an officer. Eventually there was a, quote, a clear order from the command center saying do not engage. And at that point, smelling weakness and no repercussions, the downtown was effectively turned over to the vandals, while police, up to 19,000 strong, were ordered to stay out of it. Okay, that's what he got from some cops on the force. What do you say? He's wrong. That did not happen. And in fact, there was, there was in our incident command center a lot of people mo moving as quickly as possible to ensure that we were able to respond and contain that threat in a safe way. You know, there's always anonymous people who think in, in hindsight, and the clarity of their hindsight is, is, is remarkable, but in hindsight, you know, we would have done things differently, they would have saved the day. But the reality is there was, there was a lot of people to, to, to respond to that situation. But there wasn't a go, don't there was, go, there was, go. There was no go, don't go. We, the people that are on the ground were not restricted from making tactical deployments and responses to, to what they were seeing, but they also have been trained to do it safely and, and to respond in a way that does not jeopardize public safety or jeopardize those officers and contains the threat. And a little bit of context is important as well, Steve. You know, far more cars were burned, far more windows were broken two years before when Montreal won a hockey game. Yes. And, and so, you know, there was a lot of media present, and, and of course, the, the images of those police cars burning, which is disturbing to every citizen in the city, and by the way, very disturbing to the, to the chief of the Toronto Police Service, but those, they were looped all day long. And, and I think some context of what was transpiring on Young Street was lost in, in, in the reporting. The reality was, yes, there, was, there were criminal acts that, that were taking place there. We moved as quickly as we were able to contain that threat. And, and, you know, interestingly enough, I, I read the, the reporting of, of some anonymous police sources who thought in, in, after the fact that they could do it better. But the people who had the big picture, the people that were in command of those resources in our incident command center are very experienced, competent people. Okay, some of the best this, in the country T at managing me. these types of well, events. Speaking of the country, because it wasn't just your people who were out there on the street. You That's had right. RCMP, you had Ontario Provincial Police, you had officers from other jurisdictions across the country. Twenty-two different jurisdictions. Twenty-two, okay. Here. So that, that raises a question. Was it just too many different cops from too many different places that made centralizing authority or taking a single stream of command decisions uh, too difficult? No, I, I don't believe that was the case. We've, we're in the process right now of completing a, an after action review, but we had a command structure where there was appropriate oversight through our incident command and the, the guys that were in charge of this event on that day and throughout the weekend are our most experienced major incident commanders. They've received a great deal of training. They're very experienced people in dealing with this. There was appropriate span of control and there was, I think, a, a good communication, good collaboration between all of the police services and a clear line of, of, of command that was in place for the decisions made at that okay, event. Okay, here's this, we got this from a lot of people from our web sources and that is some people alleging that uh, I don't know about you personally, but you police services in general, allowed the black bloc tactics and the anarchists to do their thing because that would give you a pretext to crack down harder in the ensuing hours and days. Steve, it's nonsense. I, first of all, our responsibility is to prevent crime. That's our first and primary responsibility and to maintain uh, public safety. Now, we were aware that people were coming in from different jurisdictions, that there were plans among certain criminal groups to engage in criminality. We apprehended many of those individuals before they came. We, we were able to prevent, I believe, a great deal of what uh, might have transpired. But unfortunately, we, we did not have complete knowledge of, of their intent. And when they turned away from the summit site, when they attacked more vulnerable areas in the city, when they essentially attacked innocent people, innocent storekeepers, and, 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 and ran up the, the street breaking windows, uh, we weren't aware Did in advance that they were going to do that. Did you hear back from store owners saying, where the hell were you guys? We were out here defenseless. Actually, I feared for my life. we work very closely with those store owners. We're out there every day. Those are our streets, and we're, we police those streets each and every day. 
and but but responding to that situation, decisions were being made at the, at the command center and by commanders right on the ground who had information about what resources they had available to them, how they were able to move them and deploy them, and they were making decisions on how to do that as safely as possible, as effectively as possible. It's 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 a little difficult if if you're going down the street and you decide you're going to smash some windows. I can't. We can't be everywhere and we can't prevent every act of vandalism and and violence that, that occurs. That's true, but you you had every reason to expect that the black block stuff was going to take place and that it was, you know, it wouldn't have been a huge stretch to say it was going to take place on the biggest street in the country, Young Street. Well, you know, what, what had happened on the Friday night, a black block contingent had been embedded in the demonstration that came across from Allen Gardens that came across Carlton and then College Street. Rather interestingly, it was quite visible. I've got lots of pictures of it. It was never reported by the press that it existed, but it was there. We managed to contain that threat all Friday evening. Unfortunately, the numbers that we were dealing with, several hundred people, and it was not just several hundred people that came down to, to, to break windows and smash cars, but, but they were also embedded within a larger group, an audience, if you will. A, a, a lot of, group of the people that came with them, they hide within a larger uh, yeah, group. They them. hide within lawful, lawful, law, a lawful, sometimes peaceful protest, either, either unno, unwittingly to the crowd or with a bit of complicity okay, in so the crowd. So let me ask the follow-up then from the previous question about... Um, about whether or not the absence of officers in a timely fashion on Young Street or at Queen and Spadina therefore resulted in a change of policy. You say no, but... No, no what, what I said no to was that... Was that you were using it that, as a pretext. That we were using it as a pretext. There okay. was no pretext. Okay. And, and certainly we're not going to put the but citizens here's the next or, our, or our, our streets in jeopardy as, as a pretext for but anything. But was there a... Dis okay, job I, is to keep I the hear peace. you saying that. But it, what, uh, you tell me then, Saturday night, there were peaceful demonstrations that took place around the city. And the response by the police to those peaceful demonstrations was much tougher than anything that people told me they saw uh, on the Saturday afternoon. So was there a decision to change the approach and get tougher? Our, our, our response was determined entirely by the actions of the crowd. So they no became decision. a mob. They became a mob. They began to commit crimes. They commit, began to break windows, to burn cars, to hurt people, to loot and to steal. And, and when they, they changed their tactics, we responded to those tactics. I believe our, our response was proportional to the threat, uh, the threat in, in, in according to our intelligence and information, and I think it was very clearly demonstrated on Saturday, that the threat uh, was a substantial one. When they changed their tactics and engaged in criminal behavior, certainly our like response what? changed. Like what criminal behavior? You know, you can't police a protest, and, and, and we have a long history in this city of policing lawful peaceful protest. And you go back over several years, and I would point even to the Tamil demonstrations, where we were deal again dealing with tens of thousands of people. Who took over a highway. Who, who went up and stood on a highway. But, and, and, and yes, they did, and they went up and stood on a highway, but the, the imminent threat to public peace, to public safety, under those circumstances was far different, far less of a threat no, for sure. than what was taking was place on Young Street yeah. and, and during, during the summer weekend. And so it enabled us to respond in, again in a proportionate way. But what crimes did, you, did your officers see happening where they felt we have to crack down harder here? These, these people had come to set fires, they'd come to smash property, they'd come to put people at risk. This is in the peaceful protest? No, no, no. This, this was what was taking place on Saturday afternoon. That threat continued. And the, we, we had people embedded in those organizations. We knew a lot about what they were doing and, and what they were planning. There, there was a plan okay, but I want to move throughout to Saturday, Saturday night. evening. There was a plan throughout Saturday evening. As a matter of fact, they had built it on their social uh, networking sites as a Saturday night fever, where they planned to rampage throughout the downtown core. And, and actually, the media was aware of this, because I was actually asked in the media uh, interview on Saturday about what plans we had to respond to that. And we did have a plan to prevent that destruction. Their intent was to use the larger crowds and to, to launch various attacks throughout the city. Our responsibility was to prevent that. Okay, Once they had just demonstrated on Saturday afternoon their criminal intent and their willingness to engage in that type of violence, that, that level of vandalism, uh, I'm not sure we had to change our response. Uh, Chief, I hear you, and I'm not sure anybody has any patience for people who want to trash the city. But I'm trying to get you to focus on what happened Saturday night down by Queen's Quay, mm -hmm. where there were several hundred people who were doing basically what the Tamils did on the Gardner Expressway. They were sitting on a street where there was no traffic. It was pouring rain. Their numbers were dwindling as a result of the bad weather. And yet, one by one by one in the hundreds, they got picked up and taken away and arrested. 
why was there a need to do that? Because the police officers on the scene determined that they had a reasonable apprehension that there were people within that crowd intent on engaging in criminal acts, and so the crowd was asked to disperse. People were asked to leave that area. When they refused to leave that area, a decision was made by the officers again on the ground. So not from in, up on top. And in order to prevent a breach of the peace, the mm -hmm. people at the Major Incident Command Center are certainly aware of it, but a decision made by the officers on, on the street based on what they were observing, based on the intelligence and the information they had available to them, that a breach of the peace was, was imminent and that, 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 that attacks would be launched from within that crowd. Okay, having looked at it, do you support that decision? Well, no, we had throughout that entire weekend, what we had was large groups of people who had gathered to protest, but within those groups there were people intent on criminality. And, and so, unfortunately, a lot of people came down to either to witness what was happening or to get in on the action and became part of the problem. It made it very difficult for us to manage that other group that, that came to commit criminal acts. And so, unfortunately, when in order to, to prevent those breaches of the peace, to prevent those criminal acts, we have to ask those people to disperse, and when they don't, whether it is intentionally complicit or simply negligently and in, in involved their presence there made it very difficult for us to, to prevent those breaches okay. of the peace. And I know a lot of people who did not come to commit crimes but were facilitating the potential of that breach of the peace. Facilitating by sitting there on the street in the pouring well, rain? By, by, by providing cover in a crowd. And, and so we asked people to disperse from those areas because we believe that, that, that their presence there represented a, a danger to the public. Can you share what intelligence you saw that suggested that there were more criminal elements uh, hidden within those well, mostly peaceful protesters? Well, I have to protesters? tell you, most of that will come out in the criminal trials that, that are underway, and I'm not going to get into the evidence. I can't. And people are entitled to their day in court, and, and, but we, we were gathering information for, for weeks and months prior to, to, uh, to the G20. We had a lot of information about various uh, groups that were coming here with an intent to engage in various levels of protest. And, you know, but a lot of the groups, a lot of the people that you're speaking of as being not involved in, in the crime, spoke very publicly about embracing what they called a diversity of tactics. And among that diversity of tactics was support for violent and criminal behavior. And, and so, would that have been in the majority? Well, you know what, you I, would, the majority I would hope the people not. were just out there trying to have a peaceful protest on a Saturday night? And, and I, I want to, people to understand how challenging it is to, on the one hand, facilitate lawful peaceful protest, which is everyone's democratic right, while you're also trying to suppress the actions of a mob, people who have come to commit destruction and you're, violence. You're and portraying vandalism. it as a mob, but, but at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night in front of the Queen's Key in the pouring rain with a few hundred people, we saw the there earlier was not attack, a mob. We saw an earlier attack launched from within a large peaceful protest on okay. Saturday afternoon. Okay. And How that's the tactic. That's, it's, it's the embracing of a diversity of tactics, which includes what, what is often referred to, and you've referred to it, as a black block tactic. Mm -hmm. Black block isn't a group. It's a tactic sure. that, the, the, that the larger uh, group employs, that some of the individuals within that group launch their attack from within the protection of a larger group. And so from a police perspective, in order to prevent those, those, those attacks from being launched, you have to disperse that larger crowd. Okay. I, I mean, I've been covering demonstrations in this city, mostly peaceful, for more than 25 years, and I, I have not seen the number of journalists uh, roughed up by the police uh, over that weekend uh, ever before. And I wonder whether, why, why were, uh, I mean, the example of the, the young man from the Guardian newspaper who was held by two cops while a third one punched him in the gut and then brought an elbow down in the small of his back. Do you know about this example? I've read your, 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 your tweets on it. And Have I, you looked I, into it? I, I've, I've read some of the media reports. I don't know whether that individual has lodged a complaint. We've, we've made some inquiries about um, whether or not he's, he's going to lodge a complaint. I'm not aware whether he has or not. Uh, if he has lodged a complaint, the matter will be investigated. And, and Is that appropriate the, tactics by the police, do you think? It, uh, 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 as, as just a person just standing there? Of course not, but I don't know the circumstances of, of what was transpiring there. Fortunately, we have the benefit of a huge amount of, of video evidence that was available to us that weekend. And you've seen it? Well, I haven't seen video evidence of that particular incident. I know that there is, um, someone told me almost three years of video available to us, mm -hmm. and, and, and tens of thousands of, of photographs that were taken. Um, and every image you see out there, Steve, people were holding up cameras, and, and so mm -hmm. I'm quite content that just about every action undertaken by the police over the course of the entire weekend was likely to have sure. been photographed. But should, should legitimately accredited reporters who have identified themselves as such to the police have been roughed up by the police? Well, nobody should be roughed up by the police. The police have a responsibility. We, we use force to, to effect a lawful purpose, but we're responsible for any excess of that. And if, if in fact, you know, 
I, I never suggest that the police are perfect in all of their responses. If a police officer exceeded his authority um, or w was excessive in the use of force, we're probably prepared to hold them accountable for that. But those matters are properly investigated, as they're supposed to be. Evidence is gathered, and if, and if, if such a complaint is substantiated, then it's dealt with. But at the same time, um, one of the things, one of the challenges we were facing for, for the G20 is, is everybody became a journalist. Everybody became a journalist. Everyone we live in who's an age ever, of citizen journalism. Every, don't we? Absolutely. Everyone who's ever posted um, a comment on a blog, everyone who's ever responded to sort of a newspaper article, um, has, has become a journalist. And one of the challenges we, we, we face is, is even journalism, even accreditation, does not give unfettered uh, access for journalists mm -hmm. into situations where there's, where there's a potential of, of, of criminality. And for example, and, and I know you've been on the streets for a long time, if we put yellow tape up around a crime scene and credentialed uh, journalists arrive, th those credentials don't give you license to, to slip under the tape and get a better look yeah, at the body. Appreciate that. There are times when, when in order to do our jobs, in order to maintain the peace, we've got to ask even credentialed journalists mm -hmm. to leave the area, to step okay, back, to let it. us do our jobs. I get it. All right. We had, um, we had lots of people say, ask them about the kettling. Uh, roll the tape, please, Michael. This is um, Queen and Spadina. We've got about 30 seconds. And this is a police technique that has been used over the years called kettling, where police sort of move in on all sides and enclose demonstrators, people, whatever, into a space so that they're more containable and uh, that the lines cannot be broken. So why don't you start by telling us why this technique is used in the first place? Well, first of all, I, I'd never even heard the phrase kettling. I, I know it's been used in the UK. I've subsequently read, read about its, uh, its use in, in other jurisdictions, and, and, and actually it was tested in the courts in, in, in England. But what I was advised is that the, the officers on, on the ground, the commanders on the ground at that location, um, in consultation with our intelligence people who were working you know, in the background, and our major command center uh, believed that there was a substantial risk contained within that crowd, and so they made a decision to contain it, and and they contained it. And, and quite was frankly, it the right decision? I think containing a risk is is the right decision. There are a number of ways in which you can do that. You can do it through dispersal, and, and usually, in in most of the tactics that I'm familiar with, we would leave an an, an avenue of of egress, so that people could leave the area, and you just convince them to leave, and you get them to disperse. My understanding is that that wasn't working particularly well and so a decision was made to contain the risk and, and that was based on the fact that it had ranged this, this particular protest on bike and on foot had ranged pretty widely right across the city and there was a, a, a very sincere concern I think among the officers on the ground and in the command center that our resources were getting rather spread out and vulnerabilities were being created. But by all accounts I've heard Chief that the, the, the number of people that you worried about uh, who represented a risk to property to life to whatever in the city was a relatively small number and yet a thousand people ended up being arrested. And some of them, you know, I mean, I know you've heard the stories, they walked out of a restaurant at the wrong time, ended up getting kettled, ended up going to jail. Somebody walking their dog, somebody walking out of their office, they ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. Why would it have been necessary to arrest so many people in the interest of just trying to get a handful of troublemakers? Well, a handful of troublemakers, I think, is, is, is a mischaracterization of what we were dealing with. You know, there's some excellent video that was available for when the original attack was launched down at, at Queen and John Street um, out of the larger protest, and, and, and it was a crowd of several hundred people. Um, and, and the video that you've shown on, on the destruction that took place across Queen Street, on King, and, and up Young Street, it's clearly got a handful of people. This was a well-organized group, and, and not everybody was, was donning black, but the, the, a lot of people were acting in concert in order to facilitate that criminal behavior. So we really were talking about uh, numbers ranging in the, in, in the area of about seven or 800 people who came to engage in criminality. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, they were also commingled with a large group of, of people who I don't believe had the intent to engage sure. in criminality. And was there any but, alternative but, to those people to having them stand out in the rain for hours well, while they got processed and then and sent and off Let me speak jail? broadly over the weekend. A lot of people came down to get in on the action or to witness what was going on and frankly for us became a significant part of the problem mm -hmm. because the black bloc tactic is to be launched from within these larger crowds. Now the situation at, at, at Queen and Spadina um, I think is a unique one. And, and a decision had been made, and I think an appropriate decision, to contain what the officers believed to be was a significant threat to public peace. A decision public made peace. by whom? Well, it was made by the officers on the ground, on the ground. Uh, okay. from their observation. But I, I know that the people in, the, in our incident command center were well aware of what was taking place there and supported the decision that was made. And, and frankly, in looking at it at the time and then after the fact, I believe the decision to contain the threat was, was, was an appropriate one. One was, of the things was, was an, an appropriate one. Inappropriate or was an appropriate? Was appropriate. It was the right thing to do okay. at the time. Okay. 
But I also believe that one of the challenges that we face is when that risk, that threat abates through the, either the passage of time, the rain that was falling, the fact that the motorcades, which we believe was the intent to be disrupted, had left the area, then it, was, it, it, it took longer than, uh, than I think, in hindsight, was necessary to, to make a determination the risk had sufficiently abated and we could let that crowd go. So did you come in and say, stop? Yeah, I did. You did? I did. I, what when I became aware of it, when I became aware of it, that, that they were standing out there in the rain and that, that the, in my opinion, the risk had abated, I went to the command center and, and the way in which these, the, the, the decision making was organized, it was a, a, a fairly well organized matrix of decision making from the commanders on the street working through the major incident command center. The only time I directly intervened in, in, a, in an operational decision over the course of that entire weekend was at Queen and Spadine on Sunday night saying, the threat is passed. Let these people go immediately and unconditionally, and we did. Okay. Let's, now we've talked about the black block techniques. We've talked about the protests. I want to talk about the five-meter rule now, or the five-meter misunderstanding, as I guess uh, it was. Let's try to understand the genesis of this law. Who asked the Ontario government to pass a regulation to that law saying nobody within five meters of the perimeter of the... First of all, that isn't what it says. What we asked for was a regulation. There were a lot of people planning in preparation for the G20. One of the things that, that, that the legal team attached to the Integrated Security Unit believed that it, there needed to be a clear articulation of the legal authorities uh, dealing with persons entering and, and leaving the summit site. The summit site. And, and, you know, we looked at a number of different legislative authorities, and, and when I say we, I mean the legal team and the police officers involved in the planning. They looked at things like, for example, the Foreign Missions Act, which guides the activities of the RCMP. They also looked at other statutory authorities containing the Police Services Act and common law authorities. And, frankly, the legal team believed that it was necessary to get a clearer articulation of those authorities. And so they uh, approached, uh, through, through my, my, my legal staff, asking if we would make a, a request of the, because the request has to come through me, a request of the Ontario government for a regulation to be passed under the Public Works Protection Act designating an area of the summit site, which was the exterior perimeter of the restricted area. The restricted area essentially was dealt with under the authority of the Foreign Missions Act. The, the perimeter immediately outside of that, which was also fenced in, under, under the Public Works Protection Act. The request was made um, under my signature to the Ontario government. And it they was, did it. it was considered by, by, by Cabinet and, order, and an order in council. Why do you think it was necessary to do? Our civil lawyers were concerned about civil liability. Almost one of the, one of the most predictable, one of the most anticipated outcomes of, of policing a summit site is that there will be public complaints and there will be lawsuits. There will be an inevitable uh, clamor for, for public inquiries. It's happened in virtually every event of, of, of similar magnitude right around the world. And so our legal team believed that it was necessary to have a more clearly articulated common law authorities, which I believe are quite uh, appropriate and sufficient under these circumstances, are not articulated because they are in the, in the common law. And so they sought a greater, greater clarification. We got that, 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 that act and, and when the regulation was passed, our legal team and my officers looked at it. They believe that it, because it, it makes reference to a, an area approaching the fence, the perimeter. And so, and there was reference in there to a five meter and their interpretation that it was five meters. That's what we trained our people on. Outside the fence though. Yeah, every one of our police officers, uh, every, you know every police officer there went through training on, on, on the- Okay, you gotta forgive me here because we're down to our last six minutes and I really wanna cover, I, I wanna make sure I understand this and get it covered properly. The Ontario government, passed the regulation yes, as you had requested and they didn't publicize that fact or they didn't publish it in the Ontario Gazette which makes it official. Well the until, Gazette hadn't come out. They right, published it on ELOS. Over. They published okay. it on ELOS. It was published. It was published but nobody knew about it I guess is the point. You knew about it. You knew what it said. You knew what it didn't say. There was a misimpression of what it actually represented. Steve, Steve when I spoke and to you, the press on Friday... And you did not try to clarify that. Well, let me, let me be really Nor clear. Nor did the government. Well, let me be very clear. On, on, on Friday, when I spoke to the press, I was, I was responding to two issues. The suggestion that it was secret, which I didn't believe it was because it had been published, and, and that, that it was sweeping. And it's not sweeping. It's actually a more clear articulation of common law authorities. But the issue of, of its perimeter, I spoke with an honest belief because that's what we had been told, that's what I had been advised by my legal team, that's what we had trained our officers on, that it pertained to an area five meters outside the fence. But you also told McLean's that you knew that wasn't the case well, and, that, no, the, and, and actually, that you wanted to keep the crooks away and, and, and that's why you didn't and that, try and to and correct that, the impression. That's absolutely a false 
characterization. As a matter of fact, that is not what I said. Look at precisely what I said in the context in which I said it. And, and the reporter who reported that tried to recharacterize my phrase. It's not but that my words were different, but he suggested I smiled when I said it. The fact is, the fact and the truth is that I believed because this is exactly what I've been told, that it was five meters outside. Now, it was immediately upon being advised by the Ontario government that that is not their, that what the regulation said. We immediately, we sent out a clear direction to every officer in the service, every officer who was working on the street. We sent an order out that afternoon, on Friday afternoon, as but, soon as we were told. But they knew, saying, and they didn't correct the record either. I'm sorry, they knew? The Ontario government knew that a misimpression was out there about what the law allowed and did not allow, well, and they made no effort we to make sure We made sure the whole idea of getting that legislation, legislation was so that our police officers would have a very clear understanding of the limits of their authority. And as soon as we got different information from, from different lawyers that it may not say what we'd originally been told it had said, we immediately clarified okay. that officer so that they did not exceed their authority. Understood. And quite frankly, within minutes of that, it became moot because okay. the, the, the demonstrations began and the area was cleared and, and no one, and let me be very clear on this, no one was charged with any offense in, within that five meter perimeter. None. Not a Not single one or person. Two people were. One person was, was charged under the Public Works Protection Act inside the fence, inside. the area that clearly the legislation okay. did pertain to. And so, Speaking of clarification, uh, I was told that numerous officers had their badges, badge numbers and names, obscured, covered up so people couldn't see them. Why would that have been done? Well, quite frankly, we have a policy and a procedure in the service, and it's a direct order from me that people, we will wear our name tags. You'll notice I'm wearing mine. Every police officer does. It's part of our uniform, and it's a requirement that they use it. Um, I became aware of, 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 of complaints of people not wearing uh, uh, their name tags. We have investigated that. We've identified a number of officers who, who were not wearing the name tags as they were required to do, and they'll be subject to discipline. They will be. Of course. Uh, our last minute and a half here. What's the one thing you could do differently if you had it to do all over again? I would like to have been able to respond more quickly uh, to the damage that occurred on Saturday afternoon. Um, I think that was, that was uh, usually prob problematic for the citizens, for this city. Um, in, in hindsight, and as I, I indicated earlier, the clarity of my hindsight is as clear as everybody else's. But we've looked very hard at, at how we can, should we ever be confronted with a similar situation in the future, respond uh, more dynamically, more rapidly to, to ensure that, that, that we minimize uh, every possibility of crowds taking place. When they told you they wanted to have a summit of this magnitude in downtown Toronto, did you say to them, are you guys out of your mind? No, I didn't. It's, it's not my job to, to comment on that. When a decision is made, uh, and, and it's, it's a decision made at a different level of government, it's a political decision to hold the summit here. My responsibility is to do everything we can to keep the citizens of Toronto safe. That's my first responsibility. We also have a shared responsibility with our federal and provincial partners to keep the summit site safe. And I believe we also have a, a responsibility to our citizens to facilitate lawful, peaceful protest. But when that lawful, peaceful protest is hijacked by the activities of criminals, intent on hiding within that lawful, peaceful protest to launch criminal acts on, on vulnerable and innocent citizens of the city, then we have a responsibility okay. to prevent that. Chief Blair, I'll give you this. We have asked representatives of the federal government to come on this program. We have asked representatives of the provincial government to come on this program and talk about their actions surrounding all of this. None of them has availed themselves of our invitation. You have. We're grateful for that. Thank you for coming in and taking our questions from both me and our viewers over the last half hour. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.